I'm going to start with the, this graph, and I swear to God, it's the only boring graph I'll show today. This is a, a study we are currently uh, developing about countries all over the world. We are studying 193 countries, how they are positioned, and how do they communicate. Not only that, but also what is the impact that that communication have in their economy. So this graph, as you see here, is a graph that talks about the yellow is Asia, the black is Africa, and the green is South America. And we have uh, composed a series of variables that show, and you can see the lines here, the green one, the yellow one, the, the blue one, what are the trends whenever you put a variable of foreign direct investment and political stability and perceptions. And from what you can see here, you can see that the green one is uh, Latin America. So our studies, what they are indicating, and this is the FDI, the foreign direct investment inflow over the last five years on those countries. And our research is concluding that the country of the future or the region of the future is Latin America. Latin America is going to be what we call today the United States of America in the future. It's not just us pointing out as this. We are just also talking about like the economist also says that. So what we are saying is that not only it will be the United States of America of the future, but it's also going to be or is already as perceived as such. So what we are saying is that a country that has a perception of the United States of America is actually migrating into South America. Now, so much that even universal pictures that have their logo on it and have the United States on front, they may have to think about <laughs> shifting and putting Latin America there because that's actually what's going to be the future. But when we talk about uh, Latin America, we, or when we talk about South America, we're not talking about the United States of South America. It's several countries, and on contrary to the United States. And with a lot of countries comes a lot of brands. And with a lot of brands comes a lot of mistakes. And what I'm here today is to talk about the common mistakes that countries actually do whenever they develop country brand strategies. And I can talk to you about not the examples that I have here on the, all the Latin American countries, but also on countries around the world and how they did it and why they did it wrong. And when I say they, it means us, country brand consultants, because it's them who they hire. It's us. And I'm going to give you an example. This is, and we're here in Germany, and this is a, a good example to talk about. Germany had a great idea. It had a fantastic idea. It has an idea for... Um, B, and, and the brand idea, the brand concept behind it was to be the, uh, uh, it was Deutschland Europe, was to be the propeller of Europe. And they even want to demonstrate this in their flag. So it was a great idea, but it was utopical. Why? Because the flag is still black. There's no blue. And the idea was to change the black to blue. And the blue is still there. <laughs> so the idea was great, but it was utopical. Everybody was forward and everybody was against it. So it didn't happen. So one of the things that we would like to say whenever we talk about country branding is that the perceptions or the, the strategies that one uses whenever developing a strategy have to be very down to earth. And down to earth, I'll explain to you in a little while what it is. Other strategies such as, for instance, Udesund, which is a region between Sweden and Denmark, which was half actually having a strategy to place that region on the map. This institution that is running this show went bankrupt. The National Institute went bankrupt. Now, who takes care of the brand? It's completely abandoned. So the strategy here, on whenever we talk about the brand strategy, is all about not just about the idea, but the infrastructure behind it, the operationality of it, the idea behind it. Because most country brand strategies, what happens is that everybody is super excited, everybody launches a brand strategy, and after three years, everybody's questioning about it, and it goes down the pipe. So how to sustain, how to measure, and how to maintain that brand strategy. I would say that one of the best examples on country branding, and actually is, is New Zealand. They actually had a fantastic idea behind the nation. They said, we are about purity. We are about um, nature. We are everything that we do, business, tourism, everything is about Purity, it's about nature. And, you know, it's probably one of the fortune countries that actually have everything so well aligned. It has no division on it. 
wrong. What happens is that the tourism of New Zealand took care of the brand. So a brand is not just one thing, but a brand or a country brand is not just one thing or doesn't have only one objective, but has several objectives. One for trade and one for tourism. And this is something that every country makes as one, but it won't work. And I'll explain to you in a little while. But I can advance in this. The messages that you want to attract tourists is relaxation, culture, enjoyment, relax. Now try to use those messages to attract foreign direct investment. Or if you want to attract messages for foreign direct investment, such as hard work, innovation, dedication, education, try to use those messages to attract tourists. You won't. So they are antagonic messages. So they have to be separated and treated as separated objectives. When we talk about even brands that had a great example, which was Spain, and everybody talks about, oh, there was such a great, great strategy behind Spain, and Spain, bullshit. <laughs> Spain did it by themselves. They didn't have any brand strategy. It was the government who was aligned. It was not us, country brand strategies, who went there and said, here's the logo, because the brand is not the logo. This is just a cherry on the top. This brand logos come and go, and then and, and the brand stays. So whenever we talk about how well we've done and how it's, it's not about the logo, but it's about the alignment of the government and determination to do it. And talking also about the strategy behind it, I'm going to talk to you about a country, which is Portugal, for instance, here, that have and has been one of the most advanced countries in terms of country branding. In five years, had five country brand strategies. So the prime minister changes, there goes the brand strategy. The Minister of Economy Chain, there goes the brand strategy. Even worse, the Director of the Tourism, there goes the brand strategy. So it's, it's, it's so interesting whenever we talk about the logistics about and how the implementation of the brand strategy. And, and I'm going to give you an example. Me, I mean, the brand strategy is a national asset. The brand of the country is a national asset, just as a monument. If I go down here and I go to the national monument there, which is a national asset that has history, and I destroy that monument, I'll be on the cover of the front page of every newspaper tomorrow, at least in Germany, and I'll be in jail. If I change the brand strategy dramatically tomorrow, nothing happens to me. And it's also a national asset. It is also something that is, has history. So it's an intangible, so it's difficult to measure. And here's an example. So this is the president of Kazakhstan. And here's also the president of Kazakhstan. <laughs> so what happened? When this gentleman, what are the damages that this gentleman has in, done in, in the national asset of the brand? It's probably 20 times worse than destroying the national parliament of Kazakhstan. And nobody did about it. They just laughed about it, like I, like I did, like you did. <laughs> so the brand strategy is, uh, once we talk about all this, there's several factors that we need to take in consideration before even launching the idea, thinking about the idea, thinking what we're going to promote. So. The idea is, okay, very well, so what is the way to go? Okay, we know that we have to be, be careful with the back office, we have to be careful with the strategy, we have to be careful with the stakeholders, with the budget, everything. Very nice. Now, South America. I'm going to talk about South America as an example. There's a fantastic tailwind, meaning there's a fantastic reputation already in that, country, in that region. So we have goodwill. There's also a fantastic opportunity, because everybody's talking about is the, the new future United States of America. So the reality is aligned with the perception. So how can a country in Latin America, for instance, and when I say Latin America, is others that have goodwill, could actually benefit and actually implement a brand strategy? And one of the answers to that, that five years ago, I would never say this, but today, thanks to social networks, we actually have the capacity, any country has the capacity with a very limited budget, with very limited resources, to actually implement a global brand strategy. So today there's more than approximately 3,000 social networks that can actually enable brands and countries to go up and to go down. As you know, all North, North Africa is having trouble and because of the dictatorships and because of political reasons, and it was all thanks to social networks. And you can see like Merci Facebook <laughs> written on the walls in Libya. <laughs> Can you imagine that, like Messi Facebook, like five years ago? How can a cool brand be associated with the fall of a country? It's like, you know, and so it's, it's really possible. And, and before that, and this is an example of Moldova, this happened like three years ago, this is how it started. It was in Twitter, and a couple of guys discussed for 15 minutes, hey, let's start something on Twitter, on Facebook. 
In 15 minutes, in after one day, the government was down. The national government was down because of a guy that was having a conversation in a coffee, taking off for 15 minutes. So, of course, I'm giving you the example for bad, but why can't countries use this for good, meaning for good purposes? I mean, this happens because there's really a national cause behind it, because they really believe in something, and then it spreads out like dust all over. So I'm going to talk to you about the ingredients that we need to take, and we can, any country that has, in a continent that has goodwill like Latin America, can actually work forward. Of course, this looks obvious, the social network and etc., but it isn't. You need one key ingredient to actually make history. Any country in South America, for instance, and also in Africa, has a fun, and, and, and not, not Northern Africa, has a fantastic opportunity to make history. To make history because it can be the future United States of America. How can you not take this opportunity? And I'm going to give you an example. An example of a country, or how can we actually build an idea of a country? And once we have this ingredient, we use those tools, the goodwill and the social networks, to make history. And I'm going to give you an example of how to build an idea behind the country. And I'm going to talk to you about a country that is called Portugal. I'm not here to promote Portugal. That's not the focus of this strategy, of this, of this presentation. It's about an idea we had on how to actually a country can differentiate itself and actually work against the bad will it has. And what you see here is what Portugal is associated with. We asked 300 CEOs all over Europe what is number one industry of Portugal. 90% said fishing. Fishing industry. The fishing industry represents less than 1% of the national GDP. The number one export and the importance of GDP beyond tourism is IT, auto components in fashion. Try to sell IT to somebody that thinks you sell fish. <laughs> so the image of Portugal is bad for Portugal. The word Portugal is bad for the Portuguese economy. So we have to create something that is not just come to Portugal because, you know, <laughs> or invest in Portugal because nobody will believe in it. So here was the briefing whenever the Minister of Economy invited us, and he said, I want to develop a brand strategy for the country. And I want you to develop a brand strategy that empowers Portugal as a country of innovation, technology, and creativity. And I said, oh, my God. <laughs> Here we go. And he said, not only that, this brand strategy works as an umbrella for trade and for tourism and actually should fit in seven sectors. And I have innovation, food and wines, home, fashion, health, Look at this, health and biotech. Look at number five, and look at number two. I mean, I don't want something, those messages mixed up together, right? So they, they're completely antagonic. And also, for completely different geographies. And you have since Angola, second to Germany, then you have Brazil, China. Look, the first one thinks you are the fifth, and the fifth one thinks you are the first, with all my respect. <laughs> so, different messages, different geographies, different objectives, and not only that, like I mentioned, business to business, business to consumer. So I have messages that are hard work and the other ones is relaxation and they're fighting all time together. So this is the big challenge. And on top of that, with no money and with a very bad reputation. So a bad perception about what is the country. So we received a briefing and we said to the Ministry of Economy, let us take some time to think about this, please. <laughs> And we put everything down on, in the office. We all working together and everybody, okay, listen, let's, let's try to separate these things and let's try to see where we can focus. Let's go to the first word that was in the briefing, innovation. Can we go after innovation? Can be Portugal perceived as innovation against countries that are there as one of the objectives, like Germany, for instance? Imagine I'm the foreign ministry or, or I'm the minister of economy and I go to Germany. Go to Portugal because it's the country of innovation. <laughs> If there are German people here, would think, sure, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm the country of innovation, if you don't mind. <laughs> and I have something to show you. Numbers. And numbers, numbers are a bitch. Because numbers destroy ideas. And numbers destroy concepts. It's all on the numbers. So I say, this is the number of patterns per inhabitant. So why are you the country of innovation? So we say, okay, let's take it off. And, uh, and then the minister, no, 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 okay. Forget Germany for a little bit. Let's talk about the Netherlands or Belgium, you know, just other countries that have their... The proof is Odin Putin. 
it's not as competitive and as innovative as those countries. So I cannot focus on that. Okay, let's take off innovation. Let's focus in technology. Can Portugal be perceived as a technological country? And then we did the same ranking. And, and I just want to show you one thing, which is this one, and I'll translate. This is employment in the services of high tech, percentage of the people employed. Portugal, 1.4%, uh, European Union, 32%. Again, the numbers don't lie. And don't think because you're saying people are going to believe in you. You have to be true. So we cannot position something. A country cannot position something that it's not, even if he wants to be, but it's not. So I cannot leverage on that. So it may be the vision. Even the government may be aligned. Even the government says, but I want to get there. That's a start. That's good. We can reach there. But we have to think of how to build a bridge to actually achieve that result. So... Out of those words, whenever we were working on the words, what word can actually be truly authentic and can be Portuguese? And the word is creativity. I know it's difficult to explain, but that's the point. Neither can you, because it's not about numbers. It's about arguments. So I can start building my concept around it, and I say why Portugal is or not a creative nation, because it has to be or at least I need to justify as it is. And I say, look, it has to do with history. Portugal has always been a country that had one border next to it. It was the enemy. Either you go to the country and die, or you can go to the sea <laughs> and explore. You have no option. Well, the Portuguese, because they like to postpone things, they say, well, let's die later, let's go to the sea. So they went to the sea, <laughs> just like the IMF. So they went to the sea, and once they went to the sea, they were forced to think outside of the box, because they were in the middle of the sea and said, like, so where now? I mean, how can we actually sail against the wind? How can we navigate? They were forced to do it. There was tension. There was something that obliged the Portuguese to think resourcefulness in a resourcefulness way whenever they had, were facing difficult challenges. And this way of thinking, and this is why Portuguese were the most advanced in nautical system, weaponry system. They were the colonizers of the globalizers of the world. That's a fact, and that's history. Nobody can deny that. So this way of thinking was actually passed on from generation to generation. And actually, that made the Portugal, or the way we call it, like the, in a very adaptive nation to extreme circumstances. So this Portuguese creativity is a mix of simplicity, ingenuity, and improvisation. It's three things all together. I can tell you this. The German creativity doesn't have this. So it's an asset that Germany has creativity, has other creativity, other components. So what we're trying to do is to encompass a concept and actually mold this and make it as strong as possible so that it's authentic and ownable from a country. Something that the Portuguese could be proud. And not only that, this way of thinking is visible today in the day-to-day -day business because there's a lot of Portuguese diaspora. There's a lot of Portuguese expats around the world that actually apply the way of thinking. So it's not so much about Portugal, but it's about the Portuguese thinking and saying, look, if you hire Portuguese, if you hire Portuguese companies, you have this kind of thinking. And this is visible today from the space shuttle up to the USB chip that everybody uses. It has Portuguese creativity in it. So it's there. So the big question now is, okay, creativity is a good concept. Uh, okay, I buy that. It's, I buy it. But is it really interesting? Do companies really want creativity? Does the world really want creativity? Well, according to the World Economic Forum, it does. Actually, the World Economic Forum says today to solve the problems, the complex problems of today, the solution is creativity. There's something talking about creative industry, something that was never talked about before. So the world is looking for that. There's even education around uh, creativity. So it's a tangible, it's, it's, sorry, it's an intangible that is not being properly managed, and it's time for the Portuguese to promote their creativity. So a way to actually make this tangible is to actually create a brand around this creativity. So the Portuguese creativity today is called real creativity, trademark. And it's property of the government. And it's like Intel inside, if you want, <laughs> to put in more other languages. So it's a way of thinking. And look, whenever the Minister of Economy goes to China or goes to Germany, he says, look, this is what I have to offer. And I'm just going to read out loud what it says here, if I can. Translate this simultaneously, okay? Just the first paragraph, and I swear I want to translate more. Real creativity is an innovative way of thinking that has as a solution 
or as a base, solutions that are alternative and completely different, being a distinctive trace of the Portuguese culture. It is a process why in each, each complex situation, simple solutions, but yet effective, are developed for the benefits of all society. The impact and real creativity in today's challenges can be managed and can communicate it for one, in one way, ingenuity for you and me. So I go to possible Chinese investors and say, this is what I have to offer. And then I talk about the brand book. And I say, look, this is what's special about the creativity. And, you know, this creativity is visible in our history. It's visible in the culture, in the environment. It's for the progress of society. And here we go, the simplicity, the ingenuity, and the improvisation. And then if we want, we can use advertising and talk about those inventions that were done by the Portuguese about the real creativity, like clothing that suits our skin. Yes, there's a company, a Portuguese textile company, that invented aloe vera in the clothing. And while you're dressing, it's moisturizing your skin. Wow, that's cool. Nobody knows about it. But why don't we communicate those things? <laughs> or the great living transformation transport. Or even pizza that never gets cold. A professor in California, a Portuguese professor, dif dis discovered a bacteria, non-offensive bacteria that actually can con uh, generate constant heat. Imagine that in pizza. <laughs> Imagine that in coding. So, and so on. And then when I talk about the country, I can say, you know, whatever I want. And I can even create a category of my own and say, I'm going to launch the Real Creativity Awards, goddammit. Nobody can beat them <laughs> because it's my category. I invented them. <laughs> it's not based on numbers. It's based on whatever I want. Of course, it has to be credible. But what I mean is it's not about the hard facts. It's not about the numbers, about the number of patents. But yes, about the ideas. Who has the best ideas? And I can even create a ranking and I give the Oscar for the best, you know, Real Creativity Award. And just to be humble, I just put the U.S. first, you know, just, you know, to make it a little bit more credible. And then next year, I'll beat it up. And I can use this stamp all over. So this was just an idea on how actually a country brand can be developed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.